Hi everyone, I'm Anya Parampil and you're watching Redlines. It's the presidential campaign season in the US, which means many political pundits are currently leaping out of your television claiming to understand the US electorate. And as voters begin to cast their ballots to elect the Democratic nominee for president, many commentators will be focused on one particular segment of the voting population. Black America. Yes, Democrats in particular love to assert they are truly the ones who sympathize with black voters and view the black vote as a coveted, almost fetishized trophy. But have Democrats sincerely represented their black constituents? Has any president from any party? Margaret Kimberly, an editor and senior columnist at the Black Agenda Report, is slated to release a new book which explores that very question. Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents details a history of the black U.S. population's relationship with their leaders, often overlooked in mainstream academia. You can order your copy on Amazon on February 4th. Margaret Kimberly joined Redlines to preview her book. Margaret Kimberly, senior editor and columnist at the Black Agenda Report. I appreciate you making time out of your busy schedule to speak with me. I wanted to start by asking you, why did you decide it was important to explore Black America's relationship with each president as an individual leader and personality, as opposed to simply producing the typical history book? Well, um, the, the typical history books are full of lies, actually. And I, I thought it was necessary to talk about each one, which was quite a challenge in some ways. Uh, some presidents are less well known, had shorter terms in office, so it was not easy to do. But what I wanted to do was create a, um, a show the thread of history uh, from enslavement until now, and the role that all that this office plays, the highest political office in the land, plays in maintaining uh, this system that began with chattel slavery and then continued with uh, uh, 100 years of uh, an American apartheid system uh, and the many, the reaction against the, the liberation movement and the reaction against it, I thought it was necessary. I realized I had to go uh, president by president and uh, show how they all played a part in this, um, uh, this really terrible history. How and why has Black America's relationship with the two dominant political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, changed over time? Republicans love to claim, for example, the legacy of Abraham Lincoln as evidence their party is progressive or even better for Black people. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, in this uh, country, which is um, founded in whiteness, really, from the, the Constitution, uh, to the, from the Declaration of Independence, which uh, admonishes the British for stirring up the Indians, it's something I was never taught in school, to the Constitution, which is a pro-slavery document, um, that history meant that one party was going to be um, more the white people's party than the other. And it's changed over time. Uh, the, as you point out, the Republicans were the, uh, the Republican Party uh, came into being in an effort to stop the spread of slavery. Uh, there were uh, people who were abolitionists, people like Lincoln who were not, but the South was the party of uh, segregation. Uh, and that was the um, the party of white racism. Meaning uh, the Democrats. For, I mean the Democrats, thank you. Uh, for about 100 years, uh, when uh, the liberation movement, commonly referred to as the civil rights movement, um, when uh, those gains took place under Democratic administration, under Johnson's administration, it was inevitable that the roles would switch. And uh, starting with Richard Nixon in 1968, um, uh, slowly but surely, the Republicans became the uh, white people's party, and that is still true. Uh, every election year, um, most uh, white people vote for Republicans. And uh, that 
people talk about that a lot with Trump, but it wasn't just Trump. It's uh, it's interesting. There's so many things about Trump. It's, he's treated as this, as this aberration when he really is not. In 1998, Nobel Prize winning author Toni Morrison described Bill Clinton as the first black president. That was in a New Yorker article, I believe. Will readers of Prejudential agree with that assessment? No, no, nobody agrees with it now. First of all, we had a black president after Clinton, after Obama became president. I think what she was referring to was uh, Clinton's um, uh, rise to the uh, highest office from, uh, you know, an ordinary working class uh, family. The fact that the right wing hated him. Uh, he was no friend of ours. Uh, we and it needs to stop. But uh, anyone hated by the by the right wing, we um, we give them more credit than they deserve. And uh, our allegiance to the Democratic Party uh, causes this um, um, this we we cling to the Democrats to any Democrat, uh, even after. Uh, I don't know if she said that uh, before or after he um, got rid of the right to public assistance, but. We saw what he did on the campaign trail when he, as governor of Arkansas, uh, excited an execution uh, order for a black man who was mentally disabled. Um, we know how he treated Lonnie Guineer, who was uh, he first nominated to head the Civil Rights Division in the Justice Department. And then when she was attacked, he dumped her. So um, uh, I understand at the time why she said it, but nobody would say that anymore. Uh, we had a real black president, and that was uh, something my whole life uh, black people debated. Could could there ever be a black president? Could it ever happen? And it did happen. So there's no need to uh, uh, call anybody else a, 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 a black uh, president. It was it, it's a very interesting moment. But uh, it's uh, now it's a footnote. It's a footnote in history. It doesn't have any legitimacy. Speaking of the first black president, the Black Lives Matter movement swept the country during the Obama years. Why do you think that is, and how do you evaluate his relationship with the black community? Well, uh, the Black Lives uh, Matter movement uh, happened because of anger. Anger, the, the realization that so many black people were uh, victims of racist uh, murder, most often by the police. Uh, at that time, there was a um, uh, a report by the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, which uh, uh, documented the number of uh, these uh, cases. And uh, they came up with the uh, figure of once every 28 hours, a black person being killed by the police or private security, or in the case of Trayvon Martin, by a private citizen. Uh, and everyone's convinced that the number is higher than, uh, than that. Uh, and once that became uh, studied, um, and these uh, all of these cases, uh, Trayvon Martin um, uh, and uh, and others, uh, Philando Castile in uh, in uh, uh, mid Minnesota, Freddie and Gray in Baltimore, and, and, yeah, yeah, and Eric so on. Carter, Freddie, New York, right, and that and being videoed, and the the fact that these killings were videoed, it was something that. Um, could only have uh, uh, have happened in the modern era, um, so it was a wellspring of anger. Uh, the The movement was a grassroots movement. It's unfortunate, though, that the organization Black Lives Matter was more tied to the Democratic Party uh, than they were to the masses of people. And this demand that police murder uh, uh, cease. And uh, so it was a moment in time that was, um, uh, in fact, ruined by Obama. This was a moment for that the presidency could have been used. I think if we'd had a white president at the time, a white Democrat would have taken some action uh, against police killings. The Obama Justice Department uh, indicted only, I think, two cops in, in eight years who uh, who committed killings. It's, uh, it's estimated three people every day, by the way, that one of those persons will be black, but two will not, will be not black. So it's a th more than a thousand people every year killed by police. It's, it's disgraceful. 
But uh, Obama uh, had this undeserved uh, love from black people. Um, partly, I mean, it's, it's very understandable. There was pride that there, there was at, at last, uh, that question was answered, that debate was over. A black person could become president. Uh, he was also attacked. Um, a, a lot of the Republican opposition to him was racial. Uh, it uh, was not really principled. And so this combination of pride and wanting to defend him from, uh, from racism, from, from racists, uh, combined to make him bulletproof. And so no matter what he did or didn't do, he had this respect and indeed this, this love and this, this admiration. But we don't have anything to show for Obama, aside from being happy to have seen him in office. He um, used black people because he, he understood that black people would be behind him. Uh, but whenever he um, was asked about specifically a black, about black people, about black unemployment, he would give the same canned answer. The rising tide lifts all boats. I'm going to do something about unemployment. It's going to help everybody. Uh, the scolding of black people. The uh, attacks, especially on black men. Uh, Pull up your pants Congress. and stop watching ESPN. What? Yes, yes, Cousin Pookie. Uh, get, tell Cousin Pookie to go and vote. It was, um, it was uh, quite, it was something a white person would not have been able to get away with. He was talking over our heads directly to white people. And this misplaced, uh, this uh, undeserving love People would defend him and say, well, he has to do it as, as though his just being president was somehow worthwhile. So people would either defend him or explain away uh, these um, these things that he said and uh, and did. He called this, uh, was this weird town hall after um, there were two police killings that re resulted in. Um, uh, the killings of police. One was in Texas, one was in Louisiana. There were two black men who took matters into their own hands, police. So that's when he called this town hall um, about police violence, but it was more uh, showing white people that he was going to keep black people in line. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a terrible case in Charleston, South Carolina, where a young white man went into a church and, and killed black people. And Obama went to the funeral to calm black people down. He didn't say anything about racism. He, I, you know, it was a eulogy for the dead and okay, that's, that's fine. But uh, he, um, whenever uh, black people started to speak up, he made uh, uh, attempts to quiet us down, to assure white people that uh, he wasn't going to listen to us that he was going to be their president as much as any other president was. So the it was a at, at the end of the day it, it was very it was very sad. He um, we have nothing to show f for his being president. Now I'm not. I have to say I'm not even a Democrat anymore. I had uh, before Obama was elected, I had uh, given up on uh, any idea of reforming the Democratic Party. I'm I'm affiliated with the Green Party. Uh, but so I was not surprised that things end this way. I often say that anybody I really like can never be president. Um, but it was a, it was a, to me, a great disappointment. I, I think, unfortunately, for the majority of black people, the fact that he was president was a success. The fact that he was president, the fact that he was reelected, uh, was something that uh, they still have positive feelings about. And I think that will be true as long as Barack Obama is alive. I'm sure the overwhelming majority of your book documents the horrific history of the U.S. government's abuse and exploitation of the black population. Is there any president you believe actually authentically wanted to do good by their black constituents, or is there anything you were surprised to learn during your research? Uh, no, I think uh, the ones who, who uh, did some good, it was always because of a... Uh, demand. Uh, FDR, for example, uh, he's another one black people loved. I mean, people of my parents' generation loved FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Eleanor, of course, uh, befriended black people. So she, you know, 
uh, arranged for Marian Anderson to sing at uh, the Lincoln Memorial and uh, her friendship with Mary McLeod Bethune uh, for black people of that day when we were generally rendered invisible was a big deal. Um, FDR's policies helped black people. Uh, he was the one who um, really established that the federal government should have a role in um, uh, the lives of of everyone and have, play a role in improving everyone's uh, life. So the Social Security Act benefited everybody. Uh, that was huge. It can't be uh, dismissed, but being a Democrat, he was beholden to uh, Southern segregationists. So he um, never signed, uh, well, it never got through Congress because of the Southern segregationists, anti-lynching legislation, for example. When, and when anybody complained, he would say, my hands are tied. I need the uh, Southern support. So uh, we have these mixed bag presidents who had done some good for the whole country. And so uh, black people benefited as a uh, result of that. But even, uh, you know, he, FDR did pass some rather tepid civil rights legislation during the war. But that's because a man named A. Philip Randolph, a black um, uh, union organizer of the uh, Pullman car porters, he threatened to march on Washington. So, uh, so that's uh, why um, there was some... Uh, uh, civil rights legislation for uh, defense industry workers. Uh, and Randolph was still alive in the 60s. And um, uh, he was uh, uh, one of those who uh, uh, was responsible for the March on Washington uh, in, during the Kennedy administration. So, uh, and Kennedy's one, he said civil rights is a moral issue, not a political issue, although that wasn't true. It was very much a political issue. But he gets undue credit. He did not, uh, he was opposed to the Freedom Rides. He and his brother, Bobby Kennedy, uh, did everything they could to stop any mass action. Uh, Bobby Kennedy hated the, the March on Washington. He thought it was uh, going to be used against his brother. Uh, Bobby Kennedy authorized the FBI surveillance of Martin Luther King. Uh, even Coretta King, I just learned in Black Agenda Report last week, we had an article. There's a, she has a 500-page dossier in the FBI files. So wow. even those who get uh, credit when you when you dig and you look behind what they did, there's there's not very much there. Finally, during the 2016 presidential campaign, I remember President Trump traveled to Detroit and asked a largely black audience. What the hell would they have to lose in voting for him? Four years later, what do you think defines the black electorate and what concrete policies could a candidate, regardless of whether or not they belong to one of the two major parties, demand if they were serious about taking care of the black population in this country? Well, his, his remark, uh, you know, what have you got to lose was, well, we had a lot to lose from uh, in general, Republicans are less friendly. People are are not. Uh, I don't mean to imply that uh, people are wrong when they say the Democrats are better, but they're only slightly better. Uh, Trump is himself obviously personally uh, racist, and uh, the policies of uh, uh, that he is pushing are are indeed uh, uh, racist immigration for for one. Um, the uh, loosening of any regulations is always bad for black people. We need government intervention. We do best when there's government intervention and we do worse uh, when there's a, a hands-off uh, approach. But in uh, here now in 2020, we see um, a replay of this uh, unfortunate um, dynamic whereby uh, black, for a variety of reasons, black politics now um, uh, consists mostly of keeping Republicans out of office. We don't make demands, we don't ask questions, the days of mass movement are long gone, and our only goal is to keep uh, Republicans out. So you, I keep seeing that Joe Biden uh, a train wreck, and also a, a man who's made very many racist statements that he still has a lot of black support. Some of it is because he was Obama's vice president, 
But I think it's because black people have been convinced mostly by propaganda, baseless propaganda, that he is the most electable. So whoever is considered most electable, whoever is thought to be the one most likely to defeat the Republican is the one who gets black support. I think if you look at policies, I think Bernie Sanders policies are the ones that black people would are most in favor of. None, you don't hear black people arguing about whether the minimum wage needs to be raised. We're the make up the majority of low wage workers in the country or student loan debt or uh, the health care problems that uh, millions of people still don't have uh, health care. Uh, all of these are things that we will get behind, but if we are convinced that the, even if someone is talking about what we want, if we don't think that person can win, they will not get our support. I think you will see, I know Iowa caucuses, I believe next week, after the early primaries, whoever is ahead and whoever black people think uh, is the best able to defeat Trump will be the one who uh, gets their uh, gets their support. Margaret Kimberly, a senior editor and columnist at the Black Agenda Report, thank you so much for your time. The book, Prejudential, Black America and the Presidents, is available on February 4th. You can get it on Amazon. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.